Hello. In the previous lecture, we proved a lot of results on irreducibility of integer polynomials in Q bracket X. Among other things, we showed Gauss's lemma, we used it to show that a monic primitive polynomial can be written as a product of two non-constant primitive polynomials precisely when it is not irreducible in Q bracket X. This was used to show the mod P irreducibility criteria. Uh, in today's lecture, we start with uh, a, a, an example or two on how we can use the mod P reducibility criteria. Um, okay, let's just start with the first example. In the first example, we are going to assume that we already know a result um, about finite fields. Uh, we are going to prove this result later in the course, but for now, we take it for granted. Uh, we know that x to the p minus x plus a is always an irreducible polynomial in z sub p bracket x when p is prime and a is a non-zero element inside the ring z sub p. This is an interesting result and we will prove this later in this course. But for now, we want to use this and show that the polynomial x to power 7 minus 7 minus 7 um, uh, plus 21 x to 3 uh, plus 14 x squared minus 8x plus 11 is irreducible in uh, Q bracket X. This is what we want to show. Um, and our tool will be the mod P criteria. Okay, so um, we look at this polynomial. We'll be, we ask ourselves what prime can help us the best. So usually the prime that can help us the best is the prime that's a uh, divisor of many of the coefficients. Because in that case, when I look at the polynomial modulo that prime, many of the coefficients disappear, we might end up getting a simpler polynomial. So in this case, by looking at the co coefficients, we decided, okay, maybe seven is the right prime to look at. So we look at fx, mod 7 and we get that it is of the form x to power 7 minus x plus 4 which is exactly of the kind that I was talking about at, at the beginning of this question. So we do know that fx mod 7 is indeed irreducible in z sub 7 bracket x. And we also notice that fx is a monic polynomial and that means that it is primitive and the prime p, the prime 7, does not divide the leading coefficient of this polynomial. So whenever I start with a monic polynomial, these two other conditions of mod p reducibility criterion are automatically satisfied. And therefore, using the mod p reducibility criterion, we can deduce that f is indeed irreducible in a q bracket x. Okay, this is one way of using uh, the mod p reducibility criterion. So at the end of the day, we need a result um, in z sub p bracket x. We need to know certain polynomial is irreducible in z sub p bracket x. And the hope is that because that's a finite uh, ring, maybe we can even list all the possible polynomials and check uh, or write an algorithm uh, that can check for us whether or not that polynomial is irreducible. Um, and a checking a polynomial is irreducible or not over a finite ring, uh, it's, it's something that a machine can actually do, assuming that the size of the ring is small. For instance, an example of that type is given next. We want to show that in the polynomial x to power 4 plus x plus 1 is irreducible in a z sub 2 bracket x. And then next, we are going to use this to understand irreducibility of the polynomial that's given over here. So 5x to power 4 um, plus 2x cubed minus 220x squared plus 221x plus 1. And we want to show that that guy is 
irreducible in Q bracket X. Okay, let's start with the first part. So again, a general comment is that uh, similar to integers, where we had our test and uh, sieve. Um, so we used that in order to understand all the prime numbers less than n. And we discussed, we said that if a prime, if, if, an, if an integer less than n is not prime, then it definitely has a divisor of size at most root n. So that's why it's enough to cross out all the multiples of numbers that are at most root n, and whatever remains is uh, a prime number. So by the same type of argument, you can compare the following logic that I'm going to say. For polynomials, you can compare it to artist and C. Every polynomial of degree n, if it's not irreducible, can be written as a product of two non-constant polynomials, and as a result, one of the degrees sh should be at most n half. So this means that if I cross out all the multiples of polynomials of uh, degree at most n half, whatever remains um, and has degree at most n is going to be an irreducible polynomial. So if I want to show a polynomial of degree 4 or degree 5, is irreducible, it's enough to show that it does not have a degree 1 and degree 2 factor, because 5 divided by 2 is 2 and a half, so I need to have a factor that has degree at most and half, and so that means that I'm going to get a factor of degree 1 or 2. The same is true for a polynomial of degree 4. So in order to show that x to power 4 plus x plus 1 is irreducible, I need to to show that it does not have degree one or degree two factors. Degree one factor is the same as saying that does it have a zero or not because of the factor theorem. So we look at the polynomial and we see that when I plug in zero or one, every element of z sub two, it has two elements, then a to power four and a, both of them have the same parity. And therefore, uh, I always end up getting one when I evaluate this polynomial at some value in z sub two. So in particular, this does not have, uh, does not have a zero in z sub two. And therefore, that, that implies that it does not have a degree one factor. Now we turn to degree two. Now we can list all the degree two and polynomials in z sub 2 bracket x. There are four of them. Um, so it's either x to the power 4, x squared plus 1, x squared plus x, x squared plus x plus 1. And we notice that the first three do have a 0 in z sub 2. The first one is 0 is the 0 of the first one, 1 is the 0 of the second one, and both the 0 and 1 are zeros of the third one. So these three cannot divide x to the power 4 plus x plus 1 as x to the power 4 plus x plus 1 does not have a 0 in z sub 2. Now, the only thing that remains is the last one. Now, I have a polynomial x squared plus x plus 1, and I want to show that it does not divide x to the power 4 plus x plus 1. I can use long division and divide x to the power 4 plus x plus 1 by x squared plus x plus 1. Doing so, we end up getting a quotient x squared plus x and a remainder of 1. In particular, uh, x, square, x to the power 4 plus x plus 1 is not divisible by x squared plus x plus 1. And that means that it is irreducible. Okay, so this shows the first part. Now let's go to the second part. Now it's a uh, it's kind of an interesting result. Okay, let, let's recall what it is, what the polynomial was. I have this polynomial. It's 5x to the power 4 plus 2x cubed plus 220 plus 221 plus 1. Again, um, I want to look at this mod some prime. It seems that uh, 2 can be a good choice because at least um, out of these five, uh, two of them are divisible by two. So I look at this guy mod two. I end up getting that it is, and the leading coefficient 
is 5, so it tends to be 1, so I get x to the power 4. And then um, the other terms disappear to you, I get uh, x and 1. So we end up getting that it is x to the power 4 plus x plus 1. And we have already discussed that it is indeed, uh, it is indeed uh, an irreducible polynomial uh, in z sub 2 bracket x. We also notice that it is a primitive polynomial and 2 does not divide the leading coefficient of f. So um, we are set and we are allowed to use the mod p irreducibility criterion for the prime p equals to 2. And uh, we get the desired result because we have already discussed that x to the power 4 plus x plus 1 is irreducible in z sub 2 bracket x. So this, this is another example of how we can use uh, mod p irreducibility criterion. One of the most elegant uh, irreducibility criterion is uh, due to, uh, criteria is due to uh, Eisenstein. The Eisenstein irreducibility criterion is, is the following. Uh, I give you a polynomial. Uh, with integer coefficients. Suppose the coefficients are denoted by a sub n, a sub 1, a sub n minus 1, a sub 1, and so on, till a sub 0. And suppose that I give you a prime p, and, and these a sub i's satisfy this series of conditions. So what are they? Uh, first of all, the prime p does not divide the leading coefficient but it does divide the rest of the coefficients. But at the same time, p squared does not divide the constant term. So again, p doesn't divide the leading coefficient. It does divide the rest of the coefficients, but it square doesn't divide the constant term. In that case, f is irreducible in q bracket x. So by just looking at coefficients immediately, we can say whether or not this binomial is irreducible in Q bracket X. I mean, it only implies one direction. Of course, we have lots of polynomials that do not satisfy these conditions and they are irreducible, but it, it's an uh, interesting tool. It can help us a lot. Okay, so um, our proof has kind of two parts. The first part uh, goes through the same uh, systematic way or uh, the techniques that we've learned so far, meaning I look at the binomial and try to look at this mod p for some prime p and see how much information we gain out of that. But then at the end of the argument, when I want to actually translate our information from mod p uh, to, the, to the binomial itself, and we use a kind of ad hoc result, um, and we will get a better understanding of this ad hoc result later when we discuss unique factorization of uh, ring of binomials with coefficients inside of it. Okay, but for now, let's try to um, let's try to understand uh, the, our proof and how Eisenstein's irreducibility criterion can be proved. Okay, so we have a prime p. Okay, so the first thing that we do is the same as before. We start with um, going from non-irreducibility in Q bracket X to factoring in Z bracket X. So that way, we have the possibility of passing to mod p, mod some number. Okay. So suppose to the contrary that my polynomial is not irreducible in Q bracket X. And because Q is a field, that means I should be able to write down F as a product of two non-constant polynomials. So suppose that these two non-constant polynomials uh, are G1 and G2. So I'm given two non-constant polynomials with coefficients inside the field of rational numbers. And uh, f is product of these two binomials. Okay. Now we know by the the way that we define 
the content of polynomials with rational coefficients that there are primitive polynomials that we call the primitive form of GIs. There are primitive polynomials G1 bar and G2 bar such that GIs are their content times these primitive polynomials. And by Gauss's lemma, we know the content of product is product of contents. So content of F is product of contents of G1 and G2. So that means if I look at this equation, this can be rewritten as that uh, as f being its content times the primitive form of g1 times the primitive form of g2. Now that g1 bar and g2 bar, both of them are integer polynomials, I'm allowed to look at them mod p. But before doing so, let's also point out that the leading coefficient of f is precisely this integer content of f times the leading coefficients of g1 bar and g2 bar. Now we know that p doesn't divide the leading coefficient of f. So this means p does not divide uh, content of f, does not divide the leading coefficient of g1 bar, does not divide the leading coefficient of g2 bar. So that means when I look at these polynomials, these primitive polynomial gi bars, when I look at them mod p, the degree doesn't drop it because the leading coefficient is not divisible by p. So when I look at it mod p, I'm going to get a non-zero uh, coefficient again, and therefore the degree stays the same. And as a result, this means that when I look at these primitive polynomials mod p, they are still non-constant. Okay, so, so far so good. Now let's look at the entire binomial mod P. I know that all the coefficients except the leading coefficient are divisible by P. This means when I look at F mod P, all the terms vanish except the leading term. So we get that the leading term is the content of F mod P times G1 bar mod P times g2 bar 1 mod p. And we have already discussed that these polynomials are non-constant polynomials. So this means I'm writing down a constant multiple of x to the n as a product of two polynomials. Later, when we discuss unique factorization, we, we immediately can say that both of these factors should be powers of x up to a multiple, up to a scalar. You see, the only irreducible factor of x to the n is x. So if I have unique factorization, then all the irreducible factors of the other side should be only x. This means both of these polynomials should be some scalar times some power of x. In particular, their value at 0 should be 0. So for now, we are going to prove just this statement, that if f is a field, if f is a field, and I give you two polynomials with coefficients inside f bracket x, similar to, to z sub p, and both of them have positive degrees, and I tell you that uh, their product is some scalar multiple of x to the n exactly the setting of this equation. Then, both of these polynomials have zero constant terms. So both of them, when I evaluate them at zero, I end up getting zero. Okay, so let's see how the proof goes. Suppose to the contrary that one of them is not zero. So let's say, for instance, H1 is not zero. That means what? That means the constant term of h1 is not zero. So that means when I write it down, suppose the coefficients of h1 are given by b sub i's, and suppose that the degree is m. So that means I can write it like this, where b sub m is not zero, and b sub zero is also not zero. Okay. Now I'm going to write down h2. h2 
is again non-constant polynomial. And then it might be that the constant term of H2 is zero. It might be the coefficient of X squared is zero and so on. I pick the, the first, the smallest degree where I'm getting a non-zero term in H sub two and I call it S. So that means I'm writing H sub two and I'm going to call the coefficients of X, uh, H sub two by C sub i's. So H sub two is C sub r x to the r plus the, the dot C sub s x to the s, where both C sub r and C sub s are non-zero. So s is the smallest index, uh, the smallest degree where the s term s term is non-zero in H sub two x. Okay, now I'm going to look at H one times H two. Before that, uh, let's notice that uh, by assumption, H1 times H2 has degree n. And um, at the same time, that is degree of H1 plus degree of H2. So that means n plus r is, is n. Have this in mind. Now let's focus on H1 times H2. This is supposed to be only one term. And that's supposed to be the nth term. Now I'm going to claim that in fact coefficient of x to the s is also non-zero in this product. So let's think about it. How can I get x to the s in this product? I have to multiply each term of h1 by each term of h2 and ask myself, when do I end up getting x to the s? Every term in H2 has degree at least S. So this means the only way that I can get X to the S is by multiplying the S term of H2 by the zero term of H1. So that's the only way that I can get X to the S. And therefore, that means H1 times H2, the coefficient of X to the S in h1 times h2 is c sub s times b sub 0. And because c sub s and b sub 0, both of them are non zero, this product is non zero. So this means we end up getting that the coefficient of x to the s is not zero in this product. And notice that s is at most r, and r is strictly less than m plus r, which was m. So this means. This is a genuinely new term. It's different from x to the n. So all of a sudden we are showing that the product of h1 and h2 have, I mean, this product has at least two non-zero terms. But that, that means it cannot be uh, c times x to the n, which is a contradiction. That means h1 at zero should be zero. And by a similar argument, H2 at zero should be zero. And so that, that gives us this lemma. But why is it useful? So we, we are going to use this exactly in the setting that we have over here, uh, the setting of star. So we are, we are going to use it for this equation. Here we are writing some scalar multiple of x to the n as product of two polynomials. Um, with coefficients inside Z sub P, which is a field. So by the lemma, we did use that when I evaluate these polynomials at zero, I should end up getting zero for both of them. So by star, we did use that when I evaluate this polynomial at zero, when I evaluate this one at zero, both of them are supposed to give me zero. That means when I evaluate the primitive polynomial G1 bar at zero, it is divisible by P. Similarly, when I evaluate G2 bar at zero, it is divisible by P. Therefore, when I multiply them, I'm going to get at least a factor of P squared. But notice the product of these two at zero is a divisor of the content of F times these. But that is exactly the value of F at zero, which is the constant term of F. So we end up showing that the constant term of F is divisible by p squared. 
But that's a contradiction because as part of assumption, we had that P squared is not divide, does not divide the constant term of F. So we get a contradiction. So this is how we prove Eisenstein, Eisenstein's irreducibility criteria. Let's see how we can use it. Of course, some examples are so clear. You look at the coefficients, you can immediately say, okay, I can use Eisenstein's irreducibility criterion for the prime, certain prime, and you are done. But how can I find out what primes I should look at? You can look at the constant term and then ask yourself, what are the primes that divide this constant term but whose square do not divide it. So that would be your candidate prime. So you start with this list of primes. If you get lucky, then you can use Eisenstein's irreducibility criterion and deduce that your polynomial is irreducible. Okay. This, I mean, in, in, in reality, this doesn't happen often, but nevertheless, uh, this is a good start. You can start with that. Okay, let's see an example, which is not as trivial. So I give you the polynomial with rational coefficients. So it's not an integer polynomial. You cannot immediately use um, the Eisenstein's criterion or mod B criterion or other examples that you have. Okay, so, but nevertheless, uh, what we can do, we can take a common denominator of this polynomial. Essentially what I'm saying, uh, the best thing to do is to look at the primitive form of our polynomial. We know that any polynomial with rational coefficients can be written as its content times a primitive polynomial. And um, that's the best thing that we have to do. I mean, that's the first thing that we have to do uh, in a sense that uh, irreducibility of the primitive form of the polynomial and the polynomial itself uh, are equivalent. So if the primitive form of f, that we often denote by f bar, at least in this course, if the primitive form f bar of f is irreducible, then f is irreducible and vice versa. And we've learned that it's much better to work with integer polynomials, especially primitive ones. Okay, so that's the first thing that we are going to do. We are going to find the primitive form of f. So when we defined, when we showed existence of uh, the content for polynomial with rational coefficients, the way that we did it was that first we cleared the denominator and then we took out the common, uh, greatest common divisor of the coefficients. So that, that's what we do um, here as well. So first I'm going to clear the denominator. That means I'm going to multiply it by 66. So I end up getting that the leading coefficient now is the leading coefficient now is uh, five times thirty-three. Then I get negative four times twenty-two, seven times sixty-six, three times six. Okay, so this is my uh, new integer polynomial. Now, if when you look at it, you see that it is primitive. So that's precisely the primitive form of f, and the content is one over sixty-six. That's not very important, but nevertheless. Uh, it's good to point this out. Now, this means fx is primitive if and only if this polynomial is primitive. Now, I, the first thing that I'll do, I, I, I try to see if Eisenstein's criterion can help me. How can I do that? I look at the constant term and I ask myself, what primes divide this constant term? So I go over the prime factors of the constant term, and I ask myself which ones have this property that the square of that prime does not divide the constant term. Now, the constant term here is nine times two. So the only divide it is uh, the, the prime number two. Okay, so that means what? That means I look at uh, prime number two and see if um, other coefficients satisfy the desired conditions. So the leading term, the leading coefficient is indeed odd. So it's okay. So, so far, so good. So the leading coefficient is, is odd. So two doesn't divide this. 
two does divide. I mean, the other coefficients, all of them are indeed even. And four does not divide the constant term. So I can use the Eisenstein zero disability criterion and deduce that this primitive form is irreducible and therefore F is irreducible. Okay, so uh, the technique that we learn in this example is that whenever we are given a rational, rational, I mean, a uh, polynomial with rational coefficients, we switch to the primitive form of the, the polynomial. And the other thing that we learn is that uh, we start with Eisenstein's criterion. And in order to find out what prime is useful for us, we look at the constant term and ask, uh, ask ourselves uh, what prime factor of the constant term uh, has this property that whose square, the square of that prime doesn't divide. Okay, so now let's see another example. The next example is actually a tricky application of uh, Eisenstein's criterion. But here we learn, in this example, we will learn that sometimes we need to play with our polynomial a bit, maybe shift it, maybe uh, add something to X and then evaluate it. And then maybe we can get uh, a condition that can help us when we look at it more at certain prime number. Okay, so what is it? what is the example? The example is the following: uh, p is prime. Then I look at the polynomial x to power p minus one plus x to power p minus two plus the dot, dot till plus x plus one. I forgot the term x here. Let me correct it. Um, okay, so it is plus x plus one. So from x to power p minus one all the way till one, I, I add them. Now the claim is that this is definitely irreducible. In, uh, this is irreducible in a q bracket x. That's the claim. As you can see, in the first glance, it has nothing to do with Eisenstein's criterion. All the coefficients are one. They have no prime factor at all. But we'll see how we can uh, use Eisenstein's criterion in order to prove this reason. But first, we have to play with the polynomial a bit. We have to understand it, understand it, uh, understand the polynomial a bit better. So we have already seen this kind of summation earlier. So at that time, we were, we were discussing about the connection between important elements and uh, units. But you've seen this kind of summations way before, maybe in um, junior high or high school and definitely in your calculus. So this is connected to geometric sums. Um, or alternatively, we can just multiply this by x, and we see that uh, the whole terms get shifted by one degree, and then when I subtract it by itself, I end up getting only x to power p minus one. So this means that uh, this summation is nothing but x to power p minus one divided by x minus one. OK, now I can get a better understanding of this if I change the variable and, and uh, make sure that the denominator is a single variable y. That means I'm shifting it by 1. That means I'm looking at f evaluated at y plus 1, let's say. Now I'm kind of calling this uh, a new polynomial. So let's say g of y is the shifted version of f, which means f at y plus 1. Then the numerator is y plus 1 to power p minus 1 divided by y. Now I can use the binomial expansion, and I get that y plus 1 to power p is y to the p, plus p choose p minus 1, y to power p minus 1, p choose 1, y plus 1. And then I have to subtract 1, divide by y. When I do that, this one cancels out this one. And then I have to divide out by y. And that means that I have to reduce the power by one. So I get that the first term is y to power p minus one. Then I get p choose p minus one, y to power p minus two, all the way to p choose one. Now, remember that uh, p always divides 
p choose i for an integer that runs from 1 to p minus 1. Now, that, that means what? That means p is a prime factor of all the coefficients except the leading term. And of course, p choose 1 is p, and that means p squared does not divide the constant term. Now we are in the realm, realm of Eisenstein's irreducibility criterion. So by Eisenstein's irreducibility criterion, this polynomial is indeed irreducible in Q bracket Y. That means I cannot write it as a product of two non-constant polynomials. Now, I claim that this immediately implies F is also irreducible. Uh, we can argue it in two different ways. One way is by saying that the, the map that sends x uh, to y plus 1, we need c, uh, that sends x to y plus 1. This map actually is an, uh, is an isomorphism from q bracket x to q bracket uh, y. And therefore, uh, an irreducible element is sent to an irreducible. This is one way of arguing. But uh, the more down-to-earth way is that assume that f is written as a product of two polynomials, then I evaluate both sides as y plus 1, and I get that g of y, which is f of y plus 1, is f1 of y plus 1 times f2 of y plus 1. Now, because g is irreducible, that means either this polynomial is constant or this one is constant. In either case, that means either f1 is constant or f2 is constant, and that exactly, that implies that f is irreducible in q bracket x. So you see, this is a tricky uh, application of um, Eisenstein's criterion, and what we learn is that sometimes it's better to uh, shift our variable by some constant and then see if we can use the criteria, uh, different criteria that we've learned. But now let's go back to this ad hoc part of the uh, proof of Eisenstein's criterion. So at some point in the proof, we said that uh, if we knew unique factorization property of the ring of polynomial coefficients inside the field, then we can get a better understanding of factors of uh, C x to the n, because the only irreducible factor of this uh, polynomial is x, we can deduce, if we have unique factorization, we can deduce that every factor of uh, this polynomial is of the form uh, some constant times a power of x for some integer that is at most n. But let's make it precise. What do we mean by uniqueness? And let's make it in much more general setting because then that way we can also uh, go back to the ring of integers and recall the fundamental theorem of arithmetic that we can write down every integer as a product of prime numbers in a unique way up to sign and reordering. This up to sign and reordering is there as well in general. So let's let's make it precise. An integral domain D is called a unique factorization domain, and we often abbreviate it and write UFD, unique factorization domain, if every non-zero, non-unit element of D can be written as a product of irreducible elements of D, that, that part is kind of existence part, we can write it as certain product of irreducible elements, and the way that we can write it as irreducible fact, I mean, as, as product of irreducible numbers, irreducible elements, this is unique up to reordering and multiplying by units. So that part we call uniqueness. So the way that you can write it as product of irreducible elements, the irreducible factors are unique up to reordering and multiplying by units. Let's try to understand um, 
Um, so we will actually come back to the uniqueness part later. Um, for now, we are going to focus on the existence part. So let's try to do the algorithm. How did we do it for integers? I give you an integer number. If it's prime, I'm done. If it's not, I can write it as product of two smaller numbers and we'll continue like that. So let's make it formal again. So if D, I give you an element D. If it is irreducible, then I'm done. If it's not irreducible, then I can write it as a product of two non-zero, non-unit elements, D1 and D2, D1 and D1 prime. So I can write down D as product of D1 and D1 prime, assuming that D is not irreducible, and both D1 and D1 prime are non-zero, non-units. Now I'm going to repeat this, these steps for each one of the factors. So repeat these steps for each one of the factors. Now, if this process terminates, I end up writing, uh, I end up writing D as a product of irreducible elements. So then I'm happy. If this process ends, then I'm happy. But that's a, that's a big gap, right? So I have to understand under what condition this process terminates. Now, suppose that it doesn't terminate and try to visualize this process. So how can we visualize this process? What I do, I, I create a kind of binary tree. So I have D at the beginning, then I write it as product of D1 prime and D1. Now I, I continue decomposing each one of them uh, unless they are irreducible as product of um, two non-zero non-unit elements. And I continue like that. Assuming that this process doesn't end, this means that I have an infinite way. At some point, I'm going to infinity. I can do this process infinitely many often. This means that I'm going to get D1 that can be decomposed into two non-zero non-units. I get D2 that can be decomposed into non-zero non-units non and so on. And now notice that D is a multiple of D1, which means D belongs to the ideal generated by D1. So the ideal generated by D is a subset of the ideal generated by D1. Now, D1 is product of its children. So this means that uh, uh, D1 is a subset of the ideal generated by D2. And so on, so we get an ascending chain of ideas. Let's also point out that we've proved that principal ideal generated by A is equal to the principal ideal generated by B precisely when A is a unit multiple of B. So A is B times U for some unit U. Now, D is supposed to be D1 prime times D1, and D1 prime is not a unit. So this means that the ideal generated by D cannot be the same as the ideal generated by D1. Similarly, D2 prime is not a unit, and D2 prime times D2 is D1, and so on. So this means all of these ideals are in fact distinct, so they are not equal to each other. All together, we are getting a strictly ascending chain of ideals. So the ideal generated by D is properly contained in the ideal generated by D1. That one is properly contained in the ideal generated by D2, and so on. Okay, so what if I don't have such a thing? So if I am living in a ring that having a strictly ascending chain of ideals is not allowed, then I'll be done. I'll be showing that I can actually write down every non-zero non-unit element as a product of irreducible elements. Let's call such a condition, let's call a ring with that condition a Noetherian ring. Okay, so what is a Noetherian ring? Amy Noether, a famous um, mathematician at the beginning of the 20th century. She contributed a lot to um, algebra, uh, theory of ideals. Uh, the elimination process, understanding zeros of binomials, and many more. 
So one of the properties that uh, she studied a lot was this chain condition, and she proved many results about rings with, with this chain condition. So what is it? So a ring is called Noetherian. If there is no infinite strictly ascending chain of ideas. So exactly excluding this possibility that we have out there. So again, let's try to understand what it means. So it means that if I give you a chain of ascend, uh, an ascending chain of ideals, then from some point on, they should be the same ideals. Then from some point on, all of them are the same ideals. So they, they cannot be, uh, they cannot be uh, strictly ascending. So again, uh, we immediately deduce that if D is a Noetherian integral domain, then this condition over here, this chain cannot happen. And that means every non-zero, non-unit element can be written as a product of irreducible elements. So we get the existence part of unique factorization domain uh, when D is uh, Noetherian. So, so far, so good. It, it's interesting, but it seems that we are cheating because uh, we reached to uh, some condition and we could not understand it. And then we defined a new property for a ring. Unless we have an effective way of understanding whether or not a ring is Noetherian, this statement is not so, is not satisfactory. So we need to understand under what condition a ring is Noetherian. Okay, so the next result that we are going to show is going to give us uh, such a good condition. Okay, so a ring A, suppose that it is a unital commutative ring, it's not that essential. Well, it's in fact, the statement that we are going to show is true for uh, every ring, but let's stick to the setting, uh, the, uh, the setting that we, we have in this course. So A is a unital commutative ring, then it is Noetherian. Precisely when every ideal of A is finitely generated. So what does that mean? A ring, is, a, an ideal is called finitely generated. If I can find a finite set that generates this. So I is called finitely generated. If I can find a finite set, A1, da, 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 A, N, such that the ideal AI is generated by these uh, finitely many elements. For instance, every principal ideal is a finitely generated ideal because it's generated by a single element. So every principal ideal is finitely generated. So and as an immediate corollary of this lemma, we get that every PID is no theory. Okay, we'll come back to this statement later. But for now, let's try to prove this, uh, this result. So this is an if and only if a statement. I have to go from left to right and then from right to left. So let's go from left to right. So suppose A is Noetherian. I want to show that every ideal is finitely generated. Suppose to the contrary that I found an ideal which is not finitely generated. Suppose I is not finitely generated. Now I'm going to define a sequence of elements inside I inductive D. Uh, with certain properties. Okay, so what are they? So the first one I choose randomly, it doesn't matter. So pick your, your favorite element inside I. Now next I say, because I is not finitely generated, the ideal generated by A1 cannot be the entire I. So the ideal generated by A1 is definitely a proper subset of I. So I can find something outside of this within I. So there exists A sub two, which is inside I, but not inside the ideal generated by A1. Now I add it to the previous thing that we had. Because again, I is not finitely generated, the ideal generated by A1 and A2 is still a proper ideal, proper subset of I. Because I is not finally degenerated, they cannot be the same. Now I can repeat this process. I can find A sub 3 that's inside I, but not inside the ideal generated by A sub 1 and A sub 2. 
and I can do this inductively and get end up getting a sequence of elements of I with the property that the ideal generated by A1 is properly contained in the ideal generated by A1 and A2. That one is properly contained in the next one and so on. So all of a sudden I'm finding an infinite strictly ascending chain of ideals inside the ring A. But that contradicts the assumption that A is Noetherian. So this contradiction implies that every ideal of A is finitely general. Okay, good. Now let's go the other way around. So suppose that every ideal of A is finitely generated. I want to show that it is Noetherian. That means I have to show that uh, there is no strictly ascending chain of ideals. So I start with some ascending chain of ideals. I want to show that from some point on, they are the same. Here is the important technique trick or uh, phenomena yeah, that's used uh, in many places in uh, ring theory or different parts of algebra. Whenever you have a chain of structures, uh, then their union often has the same uh, property. The point is that in algebra, all the computations are done locally. So if you have a chain of uh, terms, and then uh, from some point on, I mean, every operation involves only finitely many of them. That means that these finitely many belongs to one of these uh, structures. So in algebra, often chain union of chain of uh, structures share the same structure. Okay, but let's make it precise. So the claim is that when I take the union of uh, these ideals, uh, I end up getting a new ideal. So that is the claim. So we want to show that the union of A sub I's is still an ideal. So I have to show that it is closed under subtraction, and I have to also argue why it is closed under multiplication. So I pick two elements, A and B, inside this set. That means I can find two indices, I and J, such that A belongs to I sub small i, and B belongs to I sub J. Now, either small i is less than J, or at most J, or, or the other way around. It doesn't matter. So without lots of generality, let's assume that I is at most J, which means both A and B belong to the ideal I sub J. But I sub J is an ideal, so it is closed under subtraction. So A minus B belongs to this, and therefore it is still inside I. Okay, good. Now I can uh, do the same for multiplication. Multiplication is indeed easier. I pick uh, my favorite element of this union. It belongs to one of the uh, I sub I's, but that one is an ideal. So I can multiply it with whatever I want from the ring A. I will be still inside I sub I, and therefore I will be still inside the union. All together, we get that the union is indeed an ideal. Now, being an ideal, because every ideal is finitely generated, I get that I is generated by a bunch of elements, A sub 1, but that of A sub 1. Now, each one of these A sub I's should be in the union, which means they should belong to one of the ideals that they started with. Let's call that index of that ideal M sub I. Now, if M is the maximum, is the largest of these M sub I's, that implies that I sub M is the largest of all these ideals. In particular, that implies all the elements A sub one, which is inside I M sub one, A sub N, which is inside I sub M sub N. So all of them belong to this largest one. In particular, that means I sub M contains the ideal generated by these elements. But the ideal generated by these elements was the entire I, which is the union of all I sub J's. In particular, this union contains I sub J no matter what J I pick. So all of a sudden we are getting that I sub M contains all I sub J's. But on the other hand, we know that when J is more than M, we have the other inclusion, you know, I sub M is a subset of I sub J. So now these two together imply 
But starting from index 10, we are not going to change ideas. We are going to get the same idea again and again and again. And that shows that uh, such an idea is nefarious, such a ring is nefarious. And as I pointed out, that immediately implies every PID is nefarious. And therefore, every non zero, non unit element uh, in a PID can be written as a product of universal elements. Okay, it is why is it nefarious? Because every ideal is principal, which implies that every ideal is uh, is finitely generative, and therefore uh, that implies that my ring is uh, nefarious. Now, in a nefarious integral domain, we can always write down uh, every non-zero non-unit non element can be written as a product of irreducibles, and here uh, a PID is always uh, Nefarian in integral domain, and that finishes the proof. So, in the next lecture, we discuss the unit.